All right, that's a that's a Hi help. Guys. Look at that checkerboard. Show yourselves. <laughs> we were just talking about in the virtual world how coming early to a, a Zoom call is like, uh, so you're four minutes early, uh, so far. But in the real world, when you're four minutes early, you're actually late. If I, could get to, if I could get four minutes early to every meeting, I would be very proud of myself. <laughs> hey, everybody. What's up? What's up? Hey. We're going to, because we are at a hard stop today with uh, our guest uh, from Dentsu, um, we're going to get started and people are just going to kind of trickle in and, and they'll come. It looks, it looks like we have a nice uh, show, which we always do. Um, I want to go ahead and take it. I'm going to have Chris Magel, who, Chris, are you on our board? What's your, what's your yeah. role on our board? Okay, so you are on our board. That means the Ad Club of New York's board. I'm sorry. I've been on the board for six years. I know. I know. Oh, you probably have. longer than that. No, six years. Six years. But Eric, the reason that you were confused is because <clears throat> I don't show up to any board meetings. <laughs> you don't have to. Though. I have a presence on the committee. But you are and, here. Uh, on the board, but my presence is generally when you need me, I'm here. But yeah, never everyone. Uh, you want me to just say hello and introduce myself? Oh, and go, for it, go for it. Thanks, Eric. So hi everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Magel, and uh, I am the president of uh, media clients at Dentsu Aegis Network. Um, I, I'm excited to meet you all, and I'm excited to get to stop talking in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, I am also excited to introduce you to my colleagues. We've got uh, Mr. Dirk Herbert, who Hello, is everyone. Chief Strategy Officer at Dentsu, and one of my favorite coworkers. He's just a great oh. guy. I honestly have not Thank worked with a strategy you. leader that produces as much amazing work as Dirk does. So you are uh, lucky to be hearing from Dirk today, I think. Uh, and you've got Amber, who has also joined us who is one of our senior human resources and recruiting leaders. So you guys all want to make sure you get a good glimpse of her name and the spelling so that you could reach out to her <laughs> at some point when it's job hunting season. And um, uh, thank you all for joining us today. So uh, what we have prepared for your session today um, is, is Dirk and his team have put together a great piece on marketing that matters. And it's profiles like the shift that we as the advertising and media and marketing community have been experiencing probably for several years now from, you know, moving from a brand led world where brands kind of were able to dictate the message and the behavior and, you know, consumers just received it and their perceptions were either influenced or not. Um, today's world is just very different. It's a consumer led world. And um, Dirk's going to speak to you about what that means uh, for brands, you know, what consumers expect from brands, what that means in terms of how they need to evolve their behavior, and then how we are addressing that at Dentsu. And he actually does end with a case history on an actual brand, one that you wouldn't ordinarily even think uh, needs to be thinking about marketing that matters, but it's a great example because that's what makes it compelling in the first place. It's like a tough challenge. So um, with that, uh, we only have, you know, the one hour with you. And I think this presentation is probably about 35 to 40 minutes long. And we want you to be able to ask Dirk some questions. So I'm going to pass it over to Dirk to say hello. Otherwise, I'd have each of you introduce yourselves. And we'd love to get you know individual, individually. But we want to get moving on, you know, making this of most value to you. So Dirkus, take it away, my friend. All righty, well, nice to meet you all at Club of New York. Thank you so much for having me. All of the interns, great to meet you. What we wanted to share today, by the way, I am the Chief Strategy Officer at Dentsu. So that's the role that I'm playing. Um, you know, part of uh, what my team and I do is help shape the thought leadership and how Dentsu thinks about how the world of marketing is evolving and how we can help our clients be more, be more successful in navigating those changes. One of the things that I want to talk about today, uh, which I think is also a very relevant conversation, is the notion of marketing that matters. I think we're at a point in time 
where there is much greater recognition that profit and purpose have come together. There's much higher expectations for brands to not just engage in transactional relationship with consumers, but be real advocates and drivers of change. So I wanted to let you know how we think about the world, the kind of trends that we're seeing, show some examples <clears throat> of what we see other brands doing, and then take you through a case study to kind of show you how this notion of leaning into purpose and helping a brand understand what bigger role it can play in a consumer's life, not just to focus on transaction, can really open the door to much more interesting and meaningful and creative conversations um, than just thinking about turning a quick buck. So that's what I'm gonna take you through today and hopefully we can do it <clears throat> in the next 30 minutes and then open up the floor to conversations. Um, as Chris had already mentioned, we just, think and acknowledge the fact that there has been a shift in the balance of power. And it's a really important one, right? Because we used to live in a brand-led world where marketers could count on captive audiences, where they could count on forced exposure, and where really the marketer's agenda really trumped the consumer agenda. And now that really has pivoted with the rise of technology and mobile and social media, consumers are in charge, right? Today's world is no longer about captive audiences, but defined through an opt-in culture where consumers can choose to engage or block, right? Much more focus on experiences versus just communications. This notion that brands today are not just built from the advertising down, but from the experience up, that what brands do is as important, if not more than what brands say. Um, and the fact that the consumer agenda very much now is trumping the brand agenda, right? In the past, brands used to dictate how consumers were to engage with them. Today, brands have to change to live up to consumers' rising expectations of what they want from them. And in that context, we wanted to talk about what are expectations that consumers have, right? In the past, it was all about, does the product do what the marketer promised me it's supposed to do? Today, it is much, much more wide ranging, right? The majority of consumers look to brands to inspire them, to support their life and ambitions, to bring about social change. Again, almost eight out of 10 consumers look to brands as being agents of social change. Um, and to commit to goals like sustainability, and as we'll talk about later on, racial equality, and all of the kind of topics that are very much top of mind for us today. So a much broader set of expectations that consumers have of brands, which on the one hand, I think is thrilling, because it shows the importance that brands can have in a consumer's life as they do it well. But if you're a marketer, also kind of scary, because how do you move into that? How do you deliver against those expectations, right? And partly those expectations have been rising of brands because other institutions have not been living up or no longer been leading the way, the way they used to, right? What we're seeing is trust in government and institutions is waning. You see that on the left-hand side, right? Congress is at the bottom of that chart that you see there in terms of whom consumer or where consumers place their trust in actually bringing about change. Um, and especially to bring about the change that modern consumers care about, which is everything from sustainability to social equality, income disparity, privacy, fake news, climate change, all of things were five to 10 years ago, as a marketer, you would have said, well, how am I connected to that? Today, consumers expect brands to step into those conversations and drive them. And consumers are looking to brands to fill the void that other institutions no longer are filling, right? This notion of taking a public stance, 88% um, of consumers preferring to buy from a brand and marketer where they have a sense that it's truly purpose-driven, um, you know, and the notion of transparency that consumers today want to see. It, don't just show me what you're selling me, but how you go about doing it, right? Um, what are the values that you have? What are the issues that you represent? Um, you know, so today almost everything is marketing. Um, so with that, a new consumer sentiment has been emerging. We talk about the fact that modern consumers basically are telling us, don't just market at me as a transactional buyer product, but matter to me as an individual and a member of community. So this notion of stop marketing, start mattering 
is a motto that we at Dentsu talk to our clients about to figure out how can we build programs that yes, achieve commercial objectives, but also further deeper relationships with consumers around the issues that they care about. Um, and in today's climate, purpose is good for business, right? 84% of business leaders agree strongly that business transformation will have greater success if it's driven by a broader purpose rather than just a profit motive. The issue is that only 37% of marketers and leaders say that their company is currently at a point where what they do from a commercial and marketing point of view is truly integrated with a broader purpose. So there's a lot of opportunities for marketing agencies and partners to help brands move into the space that they know is their future, but they're currently not there yet. Um, the issue is that if you don't lean into the combining profit and purpose, right? Brands risk fading away. Um, there was an interesting survey <clears throat> from um, another advertising network that showed that consumers wouldn't care if 80% of brands went away tomorrow, right? That is a shockingly high amount and can be really sort of depressing if you're a marketer because you do want people to care that you exist. Uh, but then as you know, the CEO of Ben & Jerry states, the primary reason why so many companies are getting their butt kicked is because they don't actually stand for something important. They don't stand for something that is broader than um, an interest in a transaction. Um, and 2020, we feel, brings even more urgency to this notion of how can brands step outside of purely transactional relationships and be part of a broader conversation. Um, and, and the COVID crisis connected to the economic crisis that then has morphed into a racial equality crisis and then now spinning back to a health crisis has sort of brought that topic even further to the forefront. Um, COVID-19 actually has heightened the expectations that consumers have of brands to respond. Um, our own in-house research, we started what we call the Dentsu Navigator, which we've been doing on a weekly and bi-weekly basis, shows that 55% of consumers agree that brands need to acknowledge the COVID crisis and act on it and actively support the people affected by it. Um, you know, and that 67% of consumers have a more positive point of view of brands based on their response to the COVID crisis. So the notion of GM pivoting from manufacturing cars to manufacturing ventilators, LVMH repurposing their perfume division to produce hand sanitizers. Those are all things that in the past were sort of nice to have. Today we live in a world where consumers actually expect that of brands and when brands successfully step into those expectations, it builds deeper relationships, it builds preference, it drives awareness. So it is a business building kind of mechanism. Um, people are also looking for ways for brands to increase the level of support around racial equality, right? 69% of consumers in our survey agree that when brands stand up for racial equality, it can make a real difference. So people and consumers understand it's not just about lip service. There is a much, much greater potential for brands to be drivers of social change. And 70% of Americans are more likely than to support brands who respond to and support racial equality. Um, so again, the overall topic of profit and purpose ever more relevant in the kind of times that we live today, both from a health crisis, financial crisis, and racial equality crisis point of view. The interesting thing also is in the past, um, brands could sort of kind of skirt the issue and controversy by staying silent and sort of opting out and flying under the radar. That is no longer possible. Consumers actually expect brands to take a stance, either pro or con, um, but staying silent now is carrying its own cost. 56% of consumers say that they have no respect for businesses that remain silent on important issue and that they'd be less likely to support them. So staying silent is no longer an option. It comes with a cost, right? And 46% of consumers are paying more attention to what brands are seeing and doing, especially in these times of crisis. This is a really interesting statistic for us because we usually talk to clients about the fact that we live in an attention deficit economy, right? That capturing consumers' attention is harder than ever. 
what we've seen is that through this series of crises, consumers actually are actively leaning in and are monitoring what brands are doing and factoring that into account in thinking through if and how they want to engage with brands. So something really interesting to keep in mind. Um, now, as we talk about combining profit and purpose, it's worthwhile talking about what we mean by purpose, right? And the way we see it is that purpose really exists on a spectrum. Um, there is the notion of purpose by leaning into social issues. There is the notion of leaning into purpose by embracing sustainability. But then there also is the notion of, you know, embracing purpose, but just leaning and championing human needs and human connection, right? This idea of leaning into belonging, optimism, confidence, and empowerment on one hand, uh, the notion of social justice, education, healthcare, mental health on the other. And different brands choose different entry points into the conversation, and that's perfectly fine. Part of the magic of being a great marketing partner to a brand is to figure out what is the better entry points, right? Um, we know that on social issues, 64% of consumers choose, avoid, or switch products based on what stance a brand is taking. So again, while you can lean into purpose, brands need to understand that it does come with trade-offs. 83% um, of consumers would always pick a brand that has a better record of sustainability. Um, and on human needs, 75% of consumers e expect brands to anticipate their needs. So there's something to be said for all of these avenues. And again, different brands choose different ways into it. When it comes to social issues and social justice, the great example, and I'm not going to belabor this because you're probably all familiar with it, is obviously Nike, right? In 2018, they made a very conscious choice to rally around Colin Kaepernick um, and, and sort of lean into the dream crazy, dream crazy campaign around um, you know, racial equity in 2019. Uh, they doubled down on it uh, with a campaign that was focused on all of the moments once considered crazy, the Dream Crazier campaign. Um, and then most recently, they very quickly and were once some of the first ones to step into the issues and conversations and acknowledge um, the topic of systemic racism, the need for racial equality, to be anti-racist and be very outspoken about it. Um, and the interesting thing is, and the good thing is that not only did they pay sort of support through communications, but increasingly now are stepping into actions to showcase how the kind of things that they're advocating for in the world are also principles that they're now sort of internalizing and changing their own organization around it, as well as supporting causes that drive that agenda. And we're gonna talk about the notion of speaking and supporting a purpose versus actually acting on it a little bit later as a crucial element that consumers now are looking at to really see how serious a brand is. But again, Nike, one example of sort of leaning into social justice. Um, on more of a sustainability example, I wanted to show you quickly what Ben and Jerry's is doing. In 1978, two friends named Ben and Jerry opened the doors of their very first scoop shop. Their beginning was our beginning. And right from the get-go, our goals were simple. To make the best ice cream possible, use our business to do good and have fun. Because if it's not fun, why do it? Our euphoric flavors packed with generous chunks and swirls are made using the best ingredients we can ethically source. From fair trade growers, local dairy farmers, and a bakery that changes lives. We don't always voice what's popular or easy, but we always speak up for what we all believe in. That love is love, the earth is worth protecting, and success tastes sweeter when everyone benefits. Dig it, then dig in. Maybe even bite off more than you can chew. Let's stand up and be heard. And let's have fun doing it. Because it's pretty amazing the problems we can lick when we're all in this together. So again, Ben & Jerry's being a brand that I think have been very much on the forefront of saying how can we combine 
our desire for profit and purpose and bring it all together. And also being a brand that truly lives their values, right? From products that support sustainability initiatives to true activism of the founders and employees around sustainability and equality issue. And then also putting their money where their mouth is, right? Where they're putting paid media support behind the kind of issues um, you know, that they care about and recruiting people to sign petitions that drive real policy change. So a great example of not only articulating values and having them as an aspiration, but truly living them. Um, and on the side of sort of leaning into human needs, I thought a really interesting example is Dunkin' Donuts. It's a great example of showing that purpose is not and does not always have to be cause marketing. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. The purpose that Dunkin' Donuts has embraced is this notion of refilling <laughs> optimism, you know, that at a time no, this was where, was um, you know, the, the, the national discourse is heavy, they want to bring a positivity um, to the is table. Can you guys hear me? No. Somebody where? Unmuted. Yeah, we can. I think you need to mute someone. <laughs> okay, cool. But you guys can hear me, right? Yeah, sorry about that, Dirk. Good. So again, this notion of refilling optimism is at the sort of the reimagining of the Dunkin' Donuts brand. It drives their design, their brand work, the way they think about the brand and the kind of partnerships that they're engaging with, like this life is good and something good um, initiative that is all about bringing heartwarming, positive, and inspirational news and initiative and causes together that Dunkin' Donuts supports. And it's working. They've seen a 73% lift in brand value, right? Same old product, but broadened and couched and, and put into a broader purpose, gone beyond just a transactional conversation into something that is broader. It does build business. Um, leading with purpose, obviously key. We always talk about that if you know what you believe, you know how to behave. Um, you know, if Lego is all about inspiring and developing the builders of tomorrow, that includes all builders of tomorrow. So it's very easy for them to quickly pivot around the Black Lives Matter movement and racial equality concerns in this country to make clear what steps they will be taking in terms of donations. The same with Dove, who, who has a real commitment to real beauty and the diversity of beauty, quickly responding to COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement. The one thing, again, that we wanted to call out is that it can't just be words. Words has to be backed up by action, right? Supporting a movement or a cause requires sustained commitment and action. What we see from our own surveys and what's out there is that consumers are becoming increasingly savvy and with that increasingly wary of virtually signaling. So 61% of consumers feel that too many brands use societal issues as a marketing ploy. So there has to be a reinforcement that 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 is, um, you know, there, there's something real and concrete about the commitment and the support that brands are putting out into the world. Consumers are calling out brands who are only paying lip service, right? 37% of consumers think that brands only have a right to engage in racial equality, for example, if they have built up credibility around the issue. So part of the conversation is show me how you have transformed yourself before you go out and sort of advocate for some of these issues. We need to see seriousness on your own part and commitment and change before we can credibly believe that you are a true advocate of change, um, you know, which then leads to the next point, which is, Outward communication is not enough. Brands need to demonstrate how they are changing themselves around the topics that they profess to care about, whether it's social uh, causes, sustainability causes, or I would argue even human needs, right? If you're all about uh, um, refilling optimism, does Dunkin' Donuts have a corporate culture that refills the optimism of their employees, of their partners, of their suppliers, right? So consumers really <laughs> holding brands accountable and keeping track and saying what you do matters as much, if not more than what you say. So that is sort of a quick overview of how we think about the evolving landscape of marketing where profit and purpose come together, some of the trends that we're seeing. And what I now wanted to show you is a quick case study 
that sort of rallies around purpose and shows you how embracing purpose can, can actually make um, a category that, that usually is not a lean in kind of category, uh, but attractive and, and drive engagement around it. Because I think oftentimes when we talk about purpose, we talk about companies and categories like Nike, like Ben and Jerry's, where the product and the category has inherently a lot of interaction and engagement, right? Same with gaming, um, you know, fashion, art, music, sports. Those are all categories that people naturally tend towards and actually go out of their way to engage with. Um, I want to show you an example of how we leaned into purpose to take something that nobody voluntarily usually goes close to, which is uh, medication for constipation, right? In this case, Miralax, uh, which is a product that helps people be regular, right? Not something that is high on anybody's list to um, lean into and talk about unless you have an issue and then you probably do it within the privacy of your own home. Um, but that's sort of the challenge that we were faced with as, as part of the new business pitch. It's like, how can we, uh, how can we build a marketing campaign around Miralax and a related product, which is Mirafiber, um, and make it interesting and engaging? And our solution to that was lean into purpose, right? Here's what you see, what we started with, Miralax. Their tagline at the time was love your laxative, um, you know, which no consumer, ever said, but that was sort of our starting point, right? And <clears throat> then we decided to take a step back and said, let's just, let's just think about what's going on. And it always starts with who are the people that we're talking to? And what you see on the right hand side is sort of the traditional information um, that the client will give us, which is, hey, we have data that shows that women over index on fiber usage and especially women 55 plus, right? So the target that we had been given was like, women 50 plus, which in and of itself already comes with a lot of presupposed notions that we have about women 50 plus, right? And we decided to put that aside and rather than looking at sort of faceless statistics and demographics, we dug into the attitudes that these women have. And when you dig into those attitudes, something very surprising and very unwomen 50 plus actually comes to the fore, which is that these women are really leaning into and excited about exploring new things in life. They really make living life to the fullest a priority. It's all about embracing health as a new lease on life. And they're actually significantly over indexing on the philosophy that life should be as much fun as possible, right? Not things that you usually hear talked about or read about or portrayed for women 50 plus. So that started to open up a whole new way to think about this audience. And we said, listen, let's stop thinking about them as women 50 plus, which is all about demographics and stereotypes. And based on these attitudinal insights, let's talk about them as midlife bloomers, people that are interested in thriving and growing and enjoying. And the minute you start talking about your audience as midlife bloomers, you already have a very different lens through which you will view what you need to do from a marketing experience and media point of view, right? That's a very different target and opens completely new avenues of thinking than saying, yeah, we're targeting women in 50 plus, right? So this notion of understanding the audiences and not just understanding them as one dimensional data and demographics, but three dimensional people, flesh and blood with aspirations and emotional lives, one big step in sort of developing a compelling strategy. We then said the interesting thing is that a lot of the competitors, even though midlife bloomers tend to be 50 plus, none of our competitors are really talking to her. All of our competitors in this space either talk to millennials or they're actually much more male skewed. And we said that is really interesting because that feeds into a broader trend that as we were kicking the tires of how people usually talk to and about women 50 plus, we saw in broader culture, which is that there is a pattern of ignoring middle-aged women, right? Throughout media and culture. And that then ultimately started to open a really interesting door about what our purpose could be. We said the stories of women 50 plus aren't really visible in movies or TV, right? When you look at the kind of actresses that, that won any kind of awards for movies or TVs, Oscars, it's a vanishingly small group of people. And then we looked at articles out there in the world about women 50 plus, 
And it's usually either these women are invisible or it, they're being talked about as sort of being fading and, you know, sort of being on their way out. And, and we said, that is certainly not how these women see each other, right? So we said there's a real opportunity here as a brand to make wellness through digestive health relevant and compelling to midlife bloomers, right? Because nobody talks to them um, and they're basically being ignored. And um, if we want to have them engage with our product, we need to better understand how we can do it and what's going on in their heads and their hearts. Um, and there we usually have an approach where we say, where we look at what is a cultural truth, what is a consumer truth in this, in this area, and what is the product truth, and then is there an idea that sits at the center of all of this that can give us an idea of what this brand that we need to promote could be, what a new vision for this brand could be that connects to culture, to consumers, um, and, and the essence of what the product is. For the cultural truth, we looked at the fact that even though uh, our society tends to discount women 50 plus, for women 50 plus, that age is actually one of the best times in their life, right? Because it's one of the first times that women can truly focus on themselves, right? Kids are out of the house, men have their careers, so women can finally start to look after their own concerns. So there is this shift from what we call other focus to self-focus, right? And with that self-focus comes a relished chance to become a new and better self. This idea that now that women actually have the space and the time to think about themselves rather than think about the broader family, um, you know, they are considering how to transform themselves and how to think about the second chapter in their lives. And with that comes a willingness and curiosity to explore new things. So our cultural truth was that a shift from other focus to self-focus opens the door to transformation. A very simple, but a very powerful insight. We then looked at the consumer specifically, the individual, and we found that as women age and sort of cross the threshold of 50, there's much more focus on health and well-being, right? This idea that when I turned 50, it was a turning point. I started taking better care of myself in a myriad of ways and that they viewed taking control of their health as a way to get a new lease on life, right? And again, here we're using a mixture of both quantitative information that either came from a third party resource or a bespoke survey that we did, and we're combining it with qualitative insights and interviews to really get at this full mix, right? And you get then powerful stuff like, you know, my life at 50 has never been better. I have more energy, less pain, and the fire in my soul that I wish I had had when I was younger. So again, it starts to shape a very different picture of who these consumers are than what we might have assumed or how society overall portrays them. So the insight here was that midlife bloomers view taking control of their health as a way to create a more vibrant life. And then we looked at the product itself and said, what is at the core of this product? And we understood that when you have digestive issues, it's, there's not just physical and emotional discomfort, but there's also social isolation. And one way to prevent that is fiber and these kind of digestive products that Bayer offers. There's also this notion that the products that we were representing um, were actually, rather than working against women's bodies, were working with the bodies and reducing side effects. So we landed on the product truth that Miralax and Fiber remove barriers to enjoying life. And then we started to put it all together and we said, if we now reconsider what the opportunity is, we actually think that the brand could be an ally and champion for midlife bloomers by helping them take control of their digestive health to create a more vibrant life. And we knew that that was a powerful purpose. We then looked at the three different truths, the cultural consumer and product truth. And when we added them all up, we said, you know what? The strategic idea for this brand is actually not that Miralax and Mirafiber helps you love your laxative, which is a very product focused way to think about it. It's that Miralax and Mirafiber help you love your new life, right? There's a transformational quality that these products have, and that is what we want to lean into. Loving your new life reflects a cultural truth, it reflects a consumer truth, and it's true to the product itself. And all of a sudden, we had a campaign that was truly customer centric because it tied and connected to what consumers wanted 
loving and reimagining their new life rather than being the old way of doing a very product centric platform, which is love your laxative, right? So once you then talk about, we're about helping people and midlife bloomers love your new life, you start to get to a very different look and feel of how you're talking about it. I mean, if you remember, just to kind of switch back here, this is what the existing uh, website looked like. Where is it? Here it is, right? A sad looking woman on a gray washed out beach, right? Does that scream loving your new life? No. So we said, we got to do something very different, um, you know, and leaned into a different look and feel different photography, just a very different spirit, right? Um, that then sort of was rolled out into our communications, into our experience design of mobile apps and websites, and also into content, right? Because if you talk about your product as just a, um, you know, digestion related product, all you can really talk about is being regular, right? That's, that's pretty much all the permission you have to talk about. But when you talk about that as your product, you're about helping people loving their new life, well, then the whole new range of conversations open up because loving your new life includes new careers, new romance, new activities, right? So there was all of a sudden a much broader range of topics and issues that we could connect to and use as entry points into conversations with people about our product, but do it in a way that was relevant to people. It also led to a really interesting insight because as we were trying to portray midlife bloomers as vibrantly as they saw themselves, our creative team actually found that when they were looking for sort of clip art and stock photography, there was very little stock photography that reflected that vibrance. The photography actually reflected how society tends to talk about older women, right? Which was not vibrant, not adventurous, right? Not out there living life to the fullest. So we said there could be a really cool social idea where we get famous photographers to photograph women and reflect the vibrancy that they feel. And we can tie it to an effort where we actually ask our consumers to nominate women in their lives, right? Their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, to be part of this effort and sort of be photographed by, by famous photographers and then become part of a broader sort of art installation and collection that could be taken to museums, that could be shown and shared online <clears throat> to really start this conversation that, you know, Women 50 plus are way more vibrant, way more full of life and energetic and adventurous as anybody talks about it. So truly shift the way that society views that segment of the population and potentially how women themselves view themselves. So with that, I'm going to end, but I thought this was a really interesting way to demonstrate how leaning into a broader purpose through a deep understanding of consumers culture and the product itself how you can create a platform that straddles both profit and purpose and actually gets people to lean in where usually they would probably give you the, you know, peace out sign or, you know, stay back kind of thing. So um, just a little bit of an example of how we think about profit and purpose and how we think it can really invigorate all kinds of brands. You don't have to be sexy or popular. It could be a digestive product you know, that, that, um, that comes to life in a new and different way. And that everybody is why I invite Dirk Herbert to any meeting I possibly can. Thank you, my friend. You got it. Fantastic. Uh, I just would love for some folks. There's a few questions that have popped up on chat and this and that, um, who might have some questions for you. Uh, do we have you for five minutes? Do we have you for 10? You have me for seven minutes and then okay, I need to great. get idle at 1245, unfortunately. Uh, Olga, you had a question, right? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for amazing your career. And how long does it take for the strategies to blow up like presentation like this with the whole team, of course, to find the cultural truth and all this stuff? So this is, I, I know this is gonna be, this is not the answer you wanna hear, but we actually came up with a strategy in, two days 
because we had no time. It was a pitch. We were late to the pitch. Um, we needed to come up with something so quickly to, to make sure, you know, I think we had like a week left and we wanted to make sure that our creatives had enough time to actually explore the idea. So this was actually, this was a real jam. I mean, it, it started out by just sort of thinking through what could this be, right? And, and when you think about the strategy, there's, there's two ways of doing it. There's a bottom-up approach where you start with all of the data and you try to divine meaning from it, or there's a top-down approach where you kind of already have a little bit of an idea or a territory in mind, and then you kind of look for the data that helps you decide whether this was the right thing to do or not. In this case, we basically did both things at the same time. We went out and we gathered all of the data that we could, and we also got together and it was actually sort of a jamming session between strategists, account leads, uh, the creative leads, and media people. Um, and I think most importantly, what we did is we brought representatives from the midlife bloomer segment into this, right? So we actually had women that were in their 50s and 60s that were part of this conversation and could help us give a perspective on how they feel, what they consider to be priorities. And that's sort of where this notion emerged of like, hmm, these women feel way more energetic and adventurous than many people portray them. And for them, it's less about being healthy. It's about health being a transformative lever that they pull to lead a more vibrant life. Um, and that's when we just kicked around, well, maybe it's not love your new laxative. Somebody just threw out, maybe it's about love your new life. And then we sort of sat back and thought, hmm, that could be a really interesting way to go. Now let's figure out, can we tell a really compelling story about it? And is it really true? And does it really make sense? So um, it, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes there's way more rigor required, but in this case, we literally had to turn it around in two or three days um, and just really force ourselves into exploring a lot of stuff. This is, there was something inherently that resonated. There was a humanity about loving your new life. There was a focus on people rather than products. And then we just spent the rest of the time merchandising the story, getting the data to support it, um, so the creatives could bring it to life. Yeah, bravo, it will, it's beautiful, two days, wow. <laughs> it's taken me two months to pull up something and I'm like, oh, it's not good enough. <laughs> no, and this is, again, I also don't wanna raise expectations that all of this has to happen in two days. There is something to be said for a more rigorous process. Again, we were just at a point where it's like, two days is all we got, so what's the best story that we can tell, right? And a big part, I think, of strategy and planning is balancing an initial gut feeling that you have with the rigor of then looking at data and making the two come together. It does obviously require that, you know, as a strategist, you are tied into the cultural context and you are aware of a lot of the cultural conversations going on, that you have a facility to understand and quickly immerse yourself in the target audience, right? Because a lot of the, the, the women who actually worked with me on, on, on developing the strategy, they were in their mid-20s to early 30s, right? And it was really them bringing in members of the midlife bloomers into the converse, conversation that led to really fruitful conversation. So being able to immerse yourself into the real audience is key. Um, and then the rigor of data and you bring all of this together and something really interesting can come out of it in a short period of time. But again, I don't want to raise pressure points here, you know. Um, hey, Dirk, uh, one of the, one of the uh, intern members here uh, reached out and asked if you've ever considered something like more edgy or irreverent, you know, in, uh, in, in this kind of a process, you know, like. For uh, this particular campaign? Yes, like was, was there anything like, you know, Shamika, do you want to speak up? You want to ask your question? So funny. Um, so we were, Julius and I were sitting over here bouncing back and forth during your presentation. And the thought that immediately popped into our head was let that ish go. Right. And so the thought of it marrying with the purpose of the brand, but then being in this new space in life where 
they can really focus on themselves. Just wondering if anything that edgy had been put forward. You know what? At the time, we did not think about it. As I said, we had two days to come up with something. This seemed really powerful. Um, one of the reasons, again, why um, edgy and humor uh, can be totally fine, I would then link it back to who's your audience, right? My question would be, is, is what you just articulated in my mind would be potentially something that would resonate more with the Generation Z and millennial kind of audience, given the cultural context that they're in? Would it resonate with the women 65 plus? I don't know, it could very well be. So one of the things, if we had had a little bit more time, could we do something more edgy? I probably would have done a little bit of a, of a, a taste test and sort of pull two or three people from that target audience in and maybe have them look at, at, at both of the options and then get their feedback um, and see, does one resonate more than the other? Is there an element in one that we could bring into the other? So not to say that there could have been a way to do it more edgy or bring in more humor, um, but we, we didn't have the time to explore it. And this seemed to be a very powerful way of bringing it to life. Um, so that would be the response to that. Yeah, the one thing I would add, uh, Dirk, from a media perspective is uh, there's so much dynamicism available now in the media space and um, you can wall things off. So uh, the ability to test what works and what doesn't is greater today, but you have to invest in the content to do it. So, um, no, so but that's a good point. We could potentially have had, for example, an execution within this broader platform that was a little bit edgier and brought humor to the table, put it into media, and then if we saw a higher response rate and engagement with that versus where we initially started, that could have been an interesting way to evolve the campaign based on real in-market performance. Yeah. There was a question about what would be the metrics that you would use to track the success of a campaign like this. Do you have any thoughts on that, Dirk? I think it, it would be the whole spectrum, right? There certainly would be um, sort of awareness, consideration, and preference metrics. I think we would look at social media engagement um, and buzz around this. Um, you know, today we we you know probably look at memes, which we didn't look at then. Um, engagement on the website, right? Yeah. Like how, how much time are people spending on the website or in the app and how much time are they spending with the content, right? I talked to you about the fact that Love Your New Life can potentially set up a broader and richer content ecosystem because we have, we have permission now not just to talk about constipation and poop, but about career and exploration and romance and things along those lines and how better health can help you lean into that. It would have you know, we would then measure, are people engaging with this content? Is it connecting to more exploration of the product? We would obviously also look at sales lift through um, online and in-store kind of purchases. So we would look at the, the whole spectrum yeah. across the entire customer journey. Yeah, with a product like this, you might even think about how much information seeking is going on on the website. That kind of a thing would be indicative of people, you know, becoming more interested. Yeah, do we see an uptick in search and things along those lines? Yep. Uh, Raquel, did you have a question for Dirk? And where I know we're conscious, we're going to lose him in a minute or two. Yes, um, I was going to say that you talked a little bit about the cultural consumer and product truth. Do you find that one typically appears before the others when you're doing a campaign, or does it really vary depending on the products? It it really depends. I mean, this this is where I have to tell you when when I when I go through this process, I try to keep all of these things in mind and then figure out where the connection is. That said, there might be times when you know. Um, in this case, I would actually probably say that the cultural insight that that midlife bloomers are ignored by society and that there could be a broader purpose of making them more visible and acknowledging the vibrancy that they feel was probably the initial trigger. And then from there, we looked at how does it manifest at a personal level, which is health for a more vibrant life. And then we connected it to the product truth, which is all about rather than working against, it works with women's bodies and started to put it all together. Sometimes there is one that becomes an entry point, but then very quickly 
I try to connect it to the other ones. I also expand it, right? Sometimes you could have a category insight and a cultural insight and a consumer insight and what we call a company insight. And sometimes it could be a communications insight in addition to the category culture consumer, right? So there, there are different entry points that you can take. It's really more, how do you find, how do you take information that everybody has access to, but it connected in ways that opens up a new way to think about an old problem, right? That is really what it's all about. And in the past, we used to stop at one insight. What I found is if you wanted to find a brand's purpose, having multiple insights like I've shown it here helps to more clearly articulate the purpose. When you can calibrate it against culture so that it's is buzzworthy, you can calibrate it against consumers so it's personally relevant, and you can calibrate it against um, the, the, the product itself, that, that it inherently has a truth that connects to the other things you're considering that's when I think you're in the best position to craft a purpose that is true and authentic and has longevity. Wow. Thank you so much, Dirk. That was amazing presentation. Um, I oh, certainly please. enjoyed oh, cool. it. Um, I know you're on a crunch for time, so thank you so much for joining us. And this recording will be available to everybody so that they can relive this experience. Um, we appreciate you so much. Cool. Thank We're going to move forward. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Um, do you, uh, Ed Club team, do you, uh, you guys want to sign off? You want to, is there any other questions? Anybody? No, we're going to move forward with um, our next segment, which is Great. Shamika and Julius, and they're Shemika, going to present luck. the part two of their noisms. Yeah. So, uh, Shamika, Julius, go ahead and take it away. Guys, I'm going to jump off. I um, hope you had a, hope, I hope you, uh, this was helpful for all of you. Thanks so much, Chris. Bye-bye. Listen, Chris, before you go, yeah. Yeah. Chris Nagel, and I think Dirk is already gone, Amanda's already gone. Thank you so much. Year after year, you show up for us, Chris. I really want to thank you. I'm double duty over here, so I'm in and out, but um, I just know based off of the chat room and all the emails I've been getting that this was really inspirational, how you were able to take, uh, what is it, Miralax? Let me make yeah. sure and really, really turn that into um, a study, an inspirational commitment to women 50 plus. Uh, so go women, go women 50 plus. I'm a big fan. Yes, <laughs> yes. So have a good day, everybody. Yeah, and, and Erica, look, uh, I, this, is the, this is the stuff that I am able to show up for and I um, am happy to show up for. Many of us in the business love uh, being able to help excite people about the business that we are in. So, yeah, let me just tell you, let yeah. me brag a little bit. This Lunch and Learn group is a combination of uh, students all throughout the nation, but, you know, within this area for sure, the, you know, the, um, the tri-state area. And this has been something, this is a journey they had to join virtually, you know, life changed for them like it changed for all of us, but they continue to show up. They really do. So this is an amazing group of uh, young people that you had an opportunity to meet today. Yeah, don't don't uh, don't fool yourselves. As far as I'm concerned, these things are a huge advertisement for uh, great potential employees. So keep in touch, everybody. Please, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Have a All great right. day. All right. Thanks again. Awesome. Chris. So I'm gonna Shemika. step away. Shamika and Julius and Maya. You all got this. I'm on my um, phone if you need me. I'm just having you guys on mute because I'm, I'm working on the fellowship, okay? And no problem. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Good to see everyone again. Um, we mentioned this at the very beginning of our time together this summer, but now we're circling back around with a, a kind of online, offline, personal branding exercise. So we're going to do this in a couple of steps. Um, it's largely based on what you do outside of here. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, the goal here is to give you an exercise for you to complete on your own time. And then we'll come back together um, next week and we'll talk about it. So hold on one second. Sorry, guys. Um, so 
with that said, when we launched our business, we had to figure out, you know, how to position ourselves in the market. Where do we stand with that? And then how to make it marketable. And in doing that, we did it through a series of steps. And so today, what we're gonna do, and that's the last page, sorry, is take you through um, a couple of steps and break it down so that you can begin to think about your own personal brand and also how you can ladder all of these things up, including the MBI assessment and part of your profile into your elevator pitch, which may come in handy during the very last session of the internship program. So today, what we're going to talk about very quickly is the notion of the mission statement and the purpose that it serves. So these are the four components that we'll go across um, and through over the next three weeks. Today, we're focused on the mission of your personal brand. So what does that mean? In creating your mission statement, there are three things that it's helpful for you to think about. One, your mission statement is really going to have to state your purpose. So in thinking about you as a brand, and you coming into an interview or into another organization, this is to crystallize what your purpose is. So why are you here? What are you bringing to the party? So the mission statement should state your purpose. It should also have you think long term. So it's not just about this next internship or this next job. It's really something that is going to influence your career. So what do you want to be known for, how will you position your purpose across the next 10, 15, 20 years? That's how long term we want to think about it. So go abroad um, and not just be fixated on this moment in time. Lastly, the goal is to keep it concise because you really want to be able to distill down what those ideas are and make it very single minded. And the clearer you are and the shorter the statement, the better it can be to help really bring you into focus. So with that, I pulled some mission statements that I thought were really clear and insightful that totally relate to the brand that they were for. The first one is Kickstarter, which is to help bring creative projects to life. You think about Kickstarter and you're like, right, they're on mission on brand, that's exactly what they do. The next one was Nike. I know there's some Nike controversy out here, but I still thought it was good, so I included it. It says, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Athlete with an asterisk to mean, if you have a body, you are an athlete. So that was Nike, a little on the longer side, but still embodying what Nike's come to represent to consumers. The next up was Google to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Again, on brand, right on point for Google. Instagram, to capture and share the world's moments. Makes a lot of sense, right on brand, what a lot of people use Instagram for. And then lastly, we have ours, collectively committed to fostering a culture of inclusion. And the adversity group is a collective of programs and partnerships and entities. So that's where the collectively comes from. And ultimately, we want to make the world a more inclusive place. So that's how we landed on ours. So the assignment for you is write your own mission statement. We're not going to do it today. Across this week and the next two, we'll just introduce the exercise to you. And in your own time, Think about it. And I wouldn't overthink it. You know, this is a type of exercise where if you stare at the blank page, nothing may happen. So spend 15, 20 minutes thinking about it and then go off and do something else. And I call this the hit and run creative technique of you put some time to it and then let it run in the background subconsciously. It may come to you when you're doing something else. So the goal here is to submit your mission statement. Again, keeping state your purpose, keep it concise, think long-term. 
by Monday at 5 p.m. And you should email it to this address, info at the only one there .com. And then next Wednesday, we'll take a few minutes to take you through the next level of the exercise, but we'll share some of the top three to four examples, um, just so everybody can get an idea of where people were starting uh, with their mission statement. So if you get it in before Monday, I can probably give you some feedback on it if you'd like. Um, if not, Monday 5 p.m. is the deadline and then we'll share some examples of the ones that rose to the top. Um, if you have any questions around this exercise or the first part, which is the mission statement, feel free to email me at info at the only one there. And then we'll just pick it up again um, next Wednesday. Okay. So with that, I will stop sharing. And um, Julius can take over for the much anticipated part two of, of Noisms from last week. All right. Hello, all. One second. How's everyone doing? Um, so we are back for part two, which it seemed like uh, was a resounding response from everyone that they wanted to continue the conversation. And I'm glad you all do. Um, because it's these types of conversations that get us closer to a deeper understanding of what others may go through um, and serve as a means for us to have deeper connections with one another. Um, before I get into that, I just want to thank those who shared last week. Um, I really appreciate the courage and, and um, you know, bravery that you all showed in sharing your own personal stories. I definitely want to open the floor up now before we go into a recap and then kind of close out the, the conversation um, and then leave room for Q&A. Um, just to hear what anyone may have taken with them from the last conversation um, to this one. I know the world is forever changing and there are a lot of things that are happening. So has anybody given any thought to any of the things that we discussed? Did anything kind of bubble up? Um, you know, feel free to jump in the chat um, or just talk aloud before we move into the presentation again. Okay, I think Olga said, I started to read more about reverse racism. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, it just was so interesting that I didn't know, does it exist okay. or it doesn't? So and just to recap um, some of the things that we talked about, um, the opening slide started with talking about um, if anyone felt like systemic racism existed. Um, there was a question in the opening clip about Black Lives Matter movement being a racist um, or a discriminatory movement. Um, I heard some thoughts on that. Um, there were mixed opinions, but primarily people felt like it was a positive um, initiative to advocate for uh, equal or you know civil rights as it relates to people of color, black people or people of African descent specifically. Um, then we started to kind of define you know, the system of racism, the examples of racism, and then systemic racism versus racism. Um, just to provide some context, we use Juneteenth, uh, 1865, as a means to be able to ground us in the jump off point, um, of which then we walk through various different levels of institutional racism, be it uh, Jim Crow, all the way through to mass incarceration. Uh, then we unpacked the first level of racism, which was institutional, so those, those um, areas of which I just named were some examples. Um, we moved into defining what equality versus equity, what the differences of, of those are, um, which I appreciate, you know, someone basically saying equality is, you know, everyone starting from the same place. Equity is uh, making up the difference in terms of disparities so that everyone can start from the same place and move together. Then we asked the question of can 
black people be racist? And this came from the fact that there are a number of people who were questioning if the Black Lives Matter movement is a racist uh, organization or if the phrase is racist in and of itself. Also, there were some people of color who were kind of, you know, of the mind and thought that people of color or black people namely cannot be racist. And so I just wanted to pose the question to you all, which we would we will end the conversation just hearing your thoughts. We also talked about and showed a clip of what people like to call Karen in Central Park. Uh, we talked about privilege. You all shared your thoughts as it relates to that, which then moved us into the second level of discrimination, which is interpersonal. Uh, which essentially is the exchange between individuals as it relates to, um, you know, different points of view um, or uh, nonverbal or verbal cues that may hint that there is a level of superiority or inferiority thinking there. Um, showed a clip, a variety of different circumstances or perspectives, um, all from the same scenario. Uh, if you all remember Indigenous Americans uh, Caucasian teens, um, and then some African Americans, the Black Hebrew Israelites. We got a mixed opinion of a variety of different people saying that this group was, you know, the villain, the victim, this group was racist, this group was not, so on and so forth. Um, but for the most part, it felt like, and you all can stop me if I'm wrong, everyone at some point felt like everyone was, was a villain and or a victim at some point. Um, which then led us into another level, which is internalized. And that's essentially when people then take on the belief that they are um, of the ideology that they oftentimes are portrayed as, um, which then leads them to feel victimized, which then can kind of um, undermine their ability to be able to move forward or progress. And now we have landed on ideological racism, um, which essentially is about the ideology. Um, and these are things that we consciously and subconsciously consume by way of church or by way of our families or by way of the news, media, so on and so forth, um, which then form how we not only see ourselves, but how we see other individuals. And this doesn't just apply, none of these, these levels that I've gone through just apply to racism, mind you. All of these things are applicable to applicable to any ism, right? We're just breaking down the system as it relates to the lens of racism, right? But it applies to any ism, of which then I think we end it with a personal story of someone being um, typecast by way of stereotypes and um, false perceptions of which were, you know, directed at them. Um, and that's where we are now. Um, to that end, I'm going to go back into the presentation. And share my screen. Can everyone see that? Okay, so perception was the last place that we landed. Um, and it was essentially us showing a news clip of how the idea of what that event played out or how it played out um, was then portrayed to the masses. Um, and oftentimes you'll find that, you know, some more insular groups will only have one sense of, uh, of a platform to be able to consume their news, which can be troubling, right? Because if you only get it from one perspective, then it could genuinely um, form your opinion to be biased toward one group or another, um, which in this case, you all were you know, vocal in saying that there are a variety of different ways this could be seen. However, this news clip kind of showed it in one particular way. So I just wanna show that clip again. A Vietnam vet in the midst of a special ceremony it does look like that young man to me is taunting the Native American Vietnam vet. This face-to-face -face confrontation igniting charges of racism. The kid, Nick Sandman, he doesn't seem to be afraid, but he did make a choice, and that was to make it into a standoff. That was not a good choice. Nick Sandman has scored a legal win after being smeared by the media. 
CNN has settled a $250 million defamation suit Sandman filed. It's over a confrontation with the Native American man that made the teenager look like the aggressor. So that lands us into this question again, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, it's the question that I originally posed at the top of the presentation, uh, which is, do you feel black people can be racist? Um, again, this is a safe space. You guys can voice your opinions. Uh, no one, there's no right, wrong answer. Um, this is really just meant to be an open dialogue. Um, but you can share your opinions based on the clips of which you all have been presented. Would anybody like to chime in? Uh, I can speak on this real quick, if that's cool. Um, okay. I just think that racism, and I've, this has been said before, it implies a level of power, especially institutionalized racism. And like the level of power that people who are white or look white have in terms of like having better perception, that type of stuff, it's something that they can use like violently against people who are non-white or appear non-white. And it's like a level of power that they have. And whereas people who are black or who appear non-white don't have that same level of influence and power where they can negatively affect another person's life to the same level that it's been negatively affected by institutionalized racism and racism throughout the history. So while people of color can be prejudiced against other people, they don't hold the same amount of power that white people hold over non-whites in especially worldwide, just due to the history that we've, like the history of the world. So I think, it's it that that's just what i think is the truth that is my truth so okay thank you for sharing i appreciate it um and then you did raise some really interesting points you talk about uh power which essentially does point to privilege in some instances right um and i love the fact that you said um those who appear white um equally as much as you said those who appear black um, or of African descent. Um, very interesting choice of words. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone else have anything to add? I just so, wanted to say it's, it's especially important that appearance of whiteness, because I know a lot of people, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Hispanic, but I know a lot of people who are Hispanic tend to think that they can't be racist or whatever, or they don't have these same, like, like they're very white passing. And so like, they think that it's like, oh, they're just as oppressed as people who are darker. Are they just, but it's a d way different level of like, things that they face and you need to, re people who are like white passing who appear white need to recognize the spaces that they can be in and the privileges that they benefit from by the proximity to whiteness. And that's the way that they can like help further the cause of those who do not appear as white. And so it's, I think it's very, that's a very important thing that people need to realize that it's just not, it's not just white black, it's that whole spectrum that people need to see how, what privileges that they benefit from and how they can leverage those to help those that do not benefit from those privileges. So. Right, thank you for sharing. That's a really great point. Actually, it's one that we're talking a lot about. Um, in the news, you've heard quite a few people talk about allyship. Um, and so kind of what does that mean? Um, you know, if we're talking about privilege in a, in a statistic in, the, in a systemic way of discrimination, which in this case we're talking about racism, there has, with factual data, um, there is a group of people who are largely marginalized and disproportionately affected as it relates to this ism in particular against another. Um, and so you raise a few good points in that regard. Um, however, what I will say though is privilege is one of those things that we all, we all as human beings either have access to or, or don't. Um, and so one of the things that I like to try and say, and I always start every presentation as it relates to noisms with, you know, the truth that is, you know, I am Julius, I am a DNI practitioner um, by, you know, you know, and but I'm also biased. And so to to kind of unpack what that bias and how that bias can manifest is a constant journey. It's something that you constantly have to be aware of. Um, and in that regard, it doesn't just apply to racism, it's any ism, right? So one of the things that I like to try and challenge individuals on, especially as it relates to particular isms that they feel extremely passionate about, is just to think about things of which you may feel your privilege and you don't even think about. 
So one of the things I often challenge individuals on is uh, ableism, right? So I myself, I think I'm a pretty able-bodied individual. Um, I am not bound to a wheelchair, do not need, you know, things of which to be able to walk. Um, and so I'm blessed in that regard. Now, if you were, and how many of you, honestly, want to get from point A to point B, and let's say, for example, point B is the inside of a building of which you want whatever it is <laughs> that's inside that building. Let's say it's, uh, I don't know, a milkshake or a smoothie, right? And so you go into that building and don't think twice about the fact that you went into that building. Now, how many of you honestly think about the fact that there may not be a wheelchair accessible ramp to get into the building for those who do not have the ability to be able to walk into that building, right? I would say that most people probably don't think about it unless they have people that they are very close to that are not able-bodied or they have themselves been uh, disabled and needed that wheelchair ramp themselves. So I think privilege kind of works in that regard, right? And that you can oftentimes be so comfortable in your privilege that you don't even think about the fact that there are some people who do not have the ability to gain the same level of access that you do. In that regard, that applies to a variety of isms, which in this case serves itself as racism. So there are a, are a large majority of people, right, to your point, who look, you know, either Caucasian um, or look like they are of African descent, which they, oftentimes they are disadvantaged in a variety of ways, which is systemic. So in the idea of how one can be an ally or in the idea of recognizing your privilege, the difference therein, you can potentially leverage your privilege or leverage your access as a means to be able to provide the same level of access to everyone. So going back to the able-bodied person, myself, using that as an example, what someone who is essentially trying to advocate for equality or equity would need to do, right? I would need to walk into the building first acknowledge the fact that there isn't a same level of access to, this, to the building. I would need to go to management and, and make that a point. I would then need to follow up with them to find out if they actually did anything about it. From that point, I would need to make sure that, at that once they did do something about it, that those who were not able to gain access to that building now know that they have access to the building. All of those various different steps require persistence. Um, and essentially, that's kind of what we're talking about, right? So that would be leveraging privilege um, to someone else's gain or benefit. So Julius can't see the uh, chat through his uh, presentation. So I'm his eyes on the chat. Just wanted to add in, Kenneth said, Black people can be prejudicial, but not racist. Racism is all about systemic oppression, and Black people don't have the kind of resources to oppress other races through institutions. Like black people can prefer light skinned black people, but they can't deny darker black people whose bank loans are housing. Okay, so thank you for sharing, Kenneth. That is a very good point, right? And so that leads me to how I started the conversation racism and systemic racism, right? And so in the examples that we showed, in the examples that we showed, a lot of individuals, almost everyone on the chat or everyone in the presentation, felt like at some point, everyone was a victim of some racist remark that was thrown their way, which include racist remarks that came from the Black Hebrew Israelites, right? So in that regard, I think people on this presentation um, felt like the idea that someone can be discriminatory as it relates to someone else's race is possible, which I would say that most of us would probably agree with based on the act of discriminating against someone based on their race. However, you raise a very good point, Kenneth. We're talking about the system of racism. And so the difference therein lies, do, do, does everyone have the ability to be able to leverage a racist ideology to oppress an entire group or a specific group of people? And the answer to that is no. So that then becomes the difference, right? So we as human beings, of course, we all have unconscious bias. 
we can we can point that unconscious bias toward a particular group in whatever way that we want and whatever ism that we want the act of racism is something that can happen where we've seen it right so for example those who follow sports deshaun jackson just recently got uh called out for anti-semitic uh comments uh those who are following the news nick cannon just recently got fired from viacom for anti-semitic acts so those there lie opportunities to showcase that people can be and can commit racist acts however though the system of racism in terms of being able to leverage privilege in a way that would then cause harm or cause certain groups to be oppressed is a completely different conversation of which then you just alluded to ken of talking about financial um oppression um political oppression so on and so forth so I just wanted to kind of show that there are differences in between the two. The act then though is, is really marked and marred by how much privilege or power can that particular group or that person yield or wield. Any more questions? Anything coming from the chat? Um, there was just one comment <laughs> from Alexa who yeah. said, I think ableism can apply to mental illness too. It's often difficult for others to relate to something they cannot or have not experienced. And I comment is so true, like so the invisible disabilities fall into ableism as well. I agree. So we have done presentations. Um, we've done presentations as it relates to noisms. And we always show the intersectionality of how things can manifest themselves into one person or to one situation. Um, in this case, we then illuminated, you know, racism versus the system of racism. Um, but we did do a presentation about ableism, sizeism, um, of which then we illuminated the fact that there are such things as invisible ailments, um, which then, you know, don't allow for people to be and function in their full capacity. Um, so things like um, autoimmune disease, um, you know, things like depression, anxiety, you know, oftentimes these things that you can't outwardly see and say, oh my God, that person is not able-bodied, but they don't necessarily think about them being of able mind. Um, and so, yes, you're absolutely right in that regard. And that is something to take into consideration. Absolutely. The goal though here in this conversation and any noisms conversation is really about identifying with the feeling of exclusion, which I think everyone on this call can identify with, right? There's been at some point a moment where you were the minority and there was a majority of which you may not have had the same access that they had. Um, it could be something as simple as everyone had crayons in second grade and you didn't have crayons <laughs> to, uh, you know, someone got a promotion and you didn't necessarily feel like, you know, you were treated fairly or, or, or evaluated in this, to the same kind of level. Um, and so that's really the whole identity here, really kind of identifying with the feeling moving away from the identifiable marks of which then you can show that you're similar or different from people and really kind of using that as a jump off point to be more empathetic and, and, and aware. So to that, Alexa just added, it's sad to live in a society where people first instinct is to judge instead of understanding. I think the shift to a mentality of listening rather than talking for the sake of talking would make a huge difference. Um, and then prior to that, Lauren said, thank you for the clarification. And prior to that, um, Osman said 100% co-signing Gretel's comment earlier. So I think I got it all. Absolutely. So to that end, I want to end on one point that you may hear a lot. Um, Angela Davis said a quote that assembly I paraphrased here, which is, it's not enough to be racist. It's not enough to not be racist. You have to be anti-racist. Um, and so for me, that goes back to what I was saying before, right? Sometimes you have individuals who are of privilege, who have to take the extra step in advocating for people who don't have the same level of privilege, right? And oftentimes not being racist is just perpetuating the cycle of racism, right? Because those who don't have the privilege to speak up and out in the same way that you may, they aren't, they aren't heard, right? So silence is violence. You, that's another term of which you've been hearing a lot about. Um, and so to that end, those who are interested in being allies or advocates for anti-racism 
one of the ways that you can go about doing that again is leveraging your privilege and access to advocate for those who don't have the same level of ac access. So in this regard, it's racism, but essentially it applies to any of the isms that we may talk about, which goes into what I was saying before. So as it relates to racism, anytime that you see it, anytime that you feel like, you know, someone may be the victim of microaggressions or just outward, you know, racist remarks or racist acts, please, by any means, feel free to voice your opinions, um, but also don't sit in silence or sit comfortably in your privilege to allow those things to kind of perpetuate. And again, this applies to any ism, not just racism in this regard. Any questions, comments? Feel free to jump in the chat. You can shout them out here. Um, how did you guys feel about this conversation? Hey, Julius. Um, thank you so much for this session. Um, I want to go back to that point, uh, uh, that question of can black people be racist and, and touch on Kenneth's point. I agree that as, as, a, as a race, um, you know, black people don't have the privilege to oppress systematically. But what about on an individual level? You you can think of um, examples of people, you know, in, in the agency world, there, there are people in, in leadership, right, that have the same privileges or close to same privileges as a white person or, or some other race. Um, but, uh, you know, recently with the uh, resurgence of Black Lives Movement, um, Black Lives Matter movement, um, people have raised questions that even though these people who were in the power, they didn't bring about the change that would prom that was promised, right? Um, so then, is that is that considered racism, or were they just not aware of their privileges, or um, uh, were they not able to use that and and to move beyond that uh, in in just uh, pop culture? There's always um, considered the examples of Kanye West, where you know a, a lot of the times people say that he's forgone his his blackness. Um, so is that an individual case or is that an example of uh, black people being um, giving into that system of racism? And who is the person that you called out a second ago? I'm sorry. Um, so in, in general, there, there, there can be people in, in, in power in agencies or other institutions, but also in, in terms of pop culture, Kanye has been brought up as a con controversial figure with that as well. Yeah. So, um, and again, this is my opinion. This is open dialogue. Everyone here is a part of the conversation. Um, so that is a really good example, right? Um, as it relates to, as I said before, like who, who, how were the systems created? What were the, the, what was the basis for how those systems were kind of established? Um, and what was the, race or more should I say the credential or pedigree of those who created that system. Um, so we can look at that in a variety of different ways from a political standpoint, right? This entire country, factual, was built on the backs of those who, you know, were slaves. Let's just keep it a hundred. Um, let's look at, you know, education. We can look at uh, even, you know, institutions, the workplace. Again, those who are in positions of power um, oftentimes are of a particular race or, or, um, or minority group, right? So having the ability to be able to navigate the system to not only your personal gain, but largely in the context of systemic racism to the gain of those who are part of the community of which you identify, that then illuminates you know, how much power or how much privilege one group has over another. Um, so Kanye in that regard, powerful, iconic figure as it relates to pop culture, not necessarily in a position to be able to advocate for the systemic change that he would like to see, or I would imagine that he would like to see for the community of which he identifies most um, with. So did that address the question that you were asking? Yeah, um, my, my, um, I guess where, where I was getting confused was can someone who's, who's in a power of privilege, um, even, even if he belongs from a minority, um, can he uh, perpetuate the systemic racism or not? 
but by not questioning his own privilege. Oh, can he be one of the reasons why it's being perpetuated? Yeah, because uh, he's in a power of privilege, but he's not making the difference. You can make the same argument for uh, white people who are in a power of privilege, but not actively going out of the way to make a difference. So here's, so that's actually a really good question, right? And so um, one of the things that I would bring it back to is the definition of racism. And if you look at the definition of racism and remove the different groups and races, right? Perpetuating the idea and the ideology of racism is essentially perpetuating racism. So if we look at Kanye and how he may or may not be perpetuating racism, in my opinion, we can equally ask the question about were the anti anti-Semitic uh, comments that were made by way of Deshaun Jackson doing the same thing? You know, so anyone, in my opinion, who is support in support or then continuing to build on the rhetoric of racism, again, removing the race and removing who it is that they're targeting essentially is perpetuating the idea, in my opinion, of racism, um, be it systemically or the act they're in. Question from the chat. No, this was a couple of statements back from Gretel. She said, I think it's a matter of self-preservation. They will still be the only black person in the room. They got to navigate the and black people can't always be the champion of their race. It's hard and time and work. And to that, Alexa said, Gretel, you always have such interesting points in these meetings. Um, and then a few of you know, it's not up to me. Um, not racist. Uh, Kenneth said, so true. Olga said, love the quote. And Alexa said, it's like being a quote or find knowledge power. It's not just enough to be aware. You have to do as well. Um, but to land on what Greg said in terms of having to be the champion of your, own, of your own race, everyone's not ready for that fight. Yeah. I agree. And, you know, this is really less about, you know, and to your point, like, this is less about um being the champion or the voice for your entire race because i mean everybody is a one of one right i don't speak for all men i don't speak for all black men i don't speak for all people from florida i don't like <laughs> i don't speak for everyone i speak for myself um and so really what this is about is moving away from ideologies that continue to perpetuate various different stereotypes and isms it's about making yourself self-aware of your unconscious bias and how you may be weaponizing it to, to, to put people in a disadvantaged position. Um, and so my ask in any noisms conversation that we have is continue to be curious about culture, continue to be curious about your own unconscious bias, where it may stem from, what triggers it um, so that you can be an ally, but if nothing else, so that you can be an advocate and not continuing to perpetuate it, either in your own silence or in your nonverbal or verbal cues, which then may show up as microaggressions, right? So it can be a variety of different things of which it's everything from, uh, you know, and, and if anyone is offended by any of these statements, I apologize, but these are things that I've heard, everything from you know, you're cute for a black girl or, uh, oh my God, you're so articulate for to be dot, 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 or, you know, oh, can I touch your hair? I mean, there's a variety of different ways that ism show up. Um, so just make yourself again, aware of how you may be making other individuals feel. Also be sure to check your privilege um, and once you've been made aware of the privilege or the position of power that you may be in or not, um, again, figure out if you are in a place of privilege, how you can then advocate for those who may not be in the same position. Um, to the end, uh, <laughs> Shamika will be, I know Erica, you're giggling. Shamika will be sending out a, um, an invitation for those that are interested in continuing the conversation um, for our LinkedIn group. Um, it is a private group, so all of you are invited. Um, 
but if you all are interested in asking more questions, wanting to continue the dialogue, feel free to reach out to me there. We'll also make our email addresses available if it hasn't already been. Um, again, this is a continued conversation. There's a variety of different levels of which we can have this conversation and dialogue. Everything from colorism to classism. Um, and then we can talk about other isms that exist, right? So this is one that's a never ending journey um, as it relates to making people aware. Um, but it's one that we felt was not only timely, but one that we thought would be applicable given the, the time at which we're experiencing in the world. So to that, I will pass it to Erica. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you all. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah. Julius, as always, um, you do, you're so articulate now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Listen, this is an um, important conversation and it's an uncomfortable conversation, not just to one group, but it is in that intersection of finding out what your ism is that to, um, to Julius and Shamika's point is where you start to find empathy for other people. And your generation, um, I am hopeful and positive and optimistic that you all live in that intersection. You all definitely live in that intersection as it relates to your gender and so many other things that you all refuse to be put in a box about. And um, so I'm hopeful that you take this and you have a, not a thin skin or not a necessarily thick skin, but you allow it to penetrate so you can think because we have all been taught things by our parents who've been taught things by their parents, their culture, their communities, that um, sometimes without even thinking um, can be so absolutely uh, biased and um, just really not um, forward and not thinking progressively. Um, so, I'm so happy that we've had this conversation. I'm happy that we didn't drop it off and leave it last week and that Julius and Shamika were willing to come back and have it more. Um, so please continue to evolve, continue to educate yourself. And for those who've never traveled, I don't care if it's you're traveling um, just within the United States, different cultures to understand a difference is to actually go there, understand the context in which it was created and get to know people one-on-one. -on -one. I think that has a greater effect in our, life, in our lives. With that being said, I wanna thank you all. I know we took you all a little longer. Um, so what can I say? Stay safe. COVID is here. Don't think because you're young that it's not going to affect you. Put your mask on. I know this is the mama speaking because I've seen the spike. So stay safe, you guys, okay? You all are our future. Don't want y'all going anywhere too fast, too soon. All right. Anything else? You all know where to reach me. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.